I would like to uh, welcome everybody to this first webinar in the 2021 series. Uh, this uh, webinar is hosted by the National Safe Motherhood Expert Committee, whose aim is to improve the services and care of expectant mothers and newborns in Uganda. Uh, this year we have developed and uh, developed a webinar series around different themes that are drawn out of the World Health Organization commemoration events, international commemoration events. And we know that in this month of March, there's uh, a lot of uh, discussions and commemorations around issues of around obesity. So we have, we looked out for a topic that we could discuss that relates to the care of mothers and uh, pregnant women, both in the antenatal delivery and the postnatal period. And uh, this, this afternoon, we're happy to host a team from Zambia, uh, both from Zambia Hospital and also from Nkosi uh, University uh, Postgraduate School of Medicine. They will be sharing with us around the topic and we'll have some time to have a discussion. Going forward, we'll be having uh, this webinars once, once a month on a calendar that we shall circulate very soon. And they will run on every last Thursday of the month from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. exactly. So you're welcome to block that date, the last Thursday of the month on your calendars. But also we shall be having some special webinars along the way. We know that uh, this year, Uganda and the uh, Minister of Health has prioritized to address the issues around postpartum hemorrhage, drawn from the report, uh, maternal and perinatal death surveillance and response report that was released uh, again this, uh, this month in March. One of the leading, actually the leading cause of mortality for uh, mothers, expectant mothers in this country is postpartum hemorrhage. So we shall be having some special webinars along the way together with the other activities that are drawn from the postpartum hemorrhage activity framework, which we shall also share with colleagues on our uh, mailing system. So with that, uh, those few remarks, I want to welcome the team from uh, Zambia and uh, Mother Kevin Postgraduate School of Medicine in Kozi University to take us through this uh, webinar on obesity in pregnancy and postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, Dr. Kisule Castro will be moderating and part of the presenters. So I would like to welcome him. We'll introduce himself and our colleagues and we'll dive right into this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Richard Kajimo, and thank you for the, your gracious in, invite for us to share our experiences, both from Zambia and Mother Kevin Postgraduate School. Um, we shall have uh, three presentations today, and they are not very long, so we shall leave some time at the end to discuss the uh, presentations we've, 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 uh, we're, we are going to make. We shall request everyone to write their questions and ask them at the end of all the presentations because you may get answers from one or the other. Uh, we shall start off with uh, a case presentation and this is a, a live patient we managed at Insamia Hospital probably about six months ago. And uh, we shall, this case will be presented to by Dr. Erabu. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Dr. Chisule Castro. I am one of the specialists at Insambia Hospital. I am a specialist obstetrician and gynecology and the one in charge for fetomaternal medicine unit in our department. So we were asked to make a presentation on obesity in pregnancy and therefore we obliged. Um, today with us, we shall have a third year SHO, Dr. Rabu Walter, who will be presenting to us the uh, case presentation, a case of uh, a patient we had, um, looking at how we managed and how we assessed their risks. And we also look at the complications that came with that particular patient. 
Thereafter, we shall have a presentation by uh, the nurse, a midwife, who, is, who participated in the management of the patient and also talking about management of these patients. And thereafter, I will come up with a presentation on obesity in pregnancy, looking at all the things we were able to gather. So at this point in time, allow me to welcome Dr. Rabo Walter, who is our third year SHO and soon to be specialist to start us off with his presentation. Walter. Yeah, thank you so much. And good afternoon to everyone. Uh, those are my names, Erabu Walter Trek. And I'm taking you through the case of this particular mother that we manage. And I believe this will help us to really appreciate and understand the case better because these cases are actually with us. And uh, when you manage a particular case and it's presented, uh, it's discussed later, you appreciate it better. So this is a mother. Uh, ZA uh, was a 38 year old uh, in Uganda. She's a social worker, is married, and is a Catholic. She presented to us as a gravidal theory para one plus one, and she was at 38 weeks, and she, can, she had one previous scan. And uh, she had come in for an elective cesarean section uh, together with a, a annular fee. And uh, she reported to us on the 15th of May, 2020. At the time of uh, presentation, she had no complaint and every system review were unremarkable. Allow me to take you uh, to our past obstetric and other issues before I bring you to what exactly brought her, the pregnancy that eventually brought her. So in our past obstetric history, she had a uh, one-term delivery, which was by emergency cesarean section due to fetal macrosomia. And as you can see, uh, she delivered a male baby, uh, which weighed 4.6 kilograms. And at the time of this particular admission, the baby was 19 months old. And in her past gynecological history, she had had a first trimester spontaneous miscarriage. Uh, this was in 2016 and evacuation was done. Uh, past medical history was unremarkable. Uh, the surgical history revealed that she had an appendicectomy in 2012. And in her family history, significantly, both of her parents are hypertensive. As I said before, she's a social worker. Uh, she does not take alcohol, she doesn't smoke. And she reported that most times she feeds on local food. So in the particular pregnancy that brought her, uh, at the end she had booked from Iran, Uganda hospital. Uh, she booked at 25 weeks of amenorrhea. And her blood pressure on booking was 130 out of 85 millimeters of mercury. And her pressure actually remained normal throughout the pregnancy, up to the time of delivery and even after delivery in the preparing were normal. However, her BMI, uh, was 53.3 kilograms per square meter. Uh, this was calculated from the weight of 140 kilograms and the height of 162 centimeters. And her random blood sugar on booking was uh, 65 milligrams per deciliter, slightly below normal. And they also did the RPR for syphilis, which was negative. Uh, at that time, they also did a fetal anomaly scan which revealed that she had an intrauterine pregnancy at 25 weeks. And by then the estimated weight was 732 grams. And they did not see any anomaly in this fetus. So uh, four weeks later, she transferred herself. This was a self-transfer from Iran Uganda hospital to St. Francis hospital in Zambia. And she presented to us at 29 weeks. And on presentation, uh, as if it's your final length was 34 centimeters. And you will appreciate that this was much more than the weeks of amenorrhea, which was 29. Our BMI, uh, to us, it was 49 kilograms per square meter. Our weight was 135 with a height of 165.2 centimeters. We did uh, HIV, PADRL, which were all negative. We did an oral glucose tolerance test. Uh, which was normal, though it was on the upper normal side, but it was within the normal range. 
uh, HB was 13 grams per deciliter with blood group four, less as D positive. So the issues that were in this patient uh, when we saw her, she was morbidly obese from that BMI which I mentioned before. And she also had an abdominal wall hernia. This was an incisional hernia resulting from the previous surgery. And also notably, she had goiter and uh, she had a short interpregnancy interval. I remember I said before that the baby was 19 months when she was already at term 38 weeks. And also this was a mother of advanced maternal age, 38 years, and she had one previous breast scan. So when we saw her, uh, when we saw her, we decided that this was a high risk mother. So we were to see her from the from the high risk clinic. High risk clinic in Zambia hospital is uh, specialist led. That means that every time she comes to antenatal care, she's uh, seen by specialists. So uh, six weeks later, that is at 35 weeks, we again saw her. And uh, this particular time she reported to us with the complaints of choking at night. So uh, we realized that she had apnea and uh, our symphysiofandral length was 44 centimeters. Remember she's 35 weeks, but the symphysiofandral length already 44 centimeters. And the scan at this time revealed that she had an estimated fetal weight of uh, 2.6 kilograms. The AFI was on the upper side. She actually had polyadrominals of 28.9 uh, centimeters, and the baby was presenting as bridge. So because she had goiter, uh, we decided that we do the thyroid function test. And the free T4 was uh, slightly low at 0.67. Uh, free T3 was, uh, was within normal range of 3.04 pg. And the TSH was also within normal at 1.15. Uh, the thyroid scan that was done revealed that she had multinodular goiter and had retrosternal extension more on the right compared to the left. So uh, at that time, we decided that she should be seen by a multidisciplinary team on our next review so that uh, our plan of delivery is met by a bigger team. Uh, so at 36 weeks, uh, she was seen by a team of obstetricians, a team of, uh, of surgeons and anesthesiologists so that we could plan her delivery. And at that particular time, her simplicity found a length was 45 centimeters. And in preparation for the surgery, uh, the anesthesiologist requested that we do ECG and cardiac echo, and all these were done, and the results were normal. So at that time, uh, together with the surgeon and obstetricians, we agreed that she be delivered by elective scissor at 38 weeks. And at that same time, we would do a mesh repair for the hernia. So on the 13th of May, that was last year, uh, the scissor was done and uh, it was a successful surgery together with the mesh repair of uh, the hernia. And uh, of course, this, the obstetric team delivered the baby, repaired the uterus, and handed over the, the, the procedure to the surgeons that took over and repaired uh, the incision hernia using a mesh. And we delivered a, a male unit with upper, upper score of nine at one minute and nine at, ten min at five minutes with a weight of 3,200 grams. And uh, this baby was admitted uh, for observation in the nursery and was discharged without any issue. The mother also recovered well from anesthesia. And on the first post-operative date, we encouraged her to ambulate. And also because of her weight, uh, we started her on uh, subcutaneous flexin as a thromophrophylaxis at a dose of 60 milligrams once a day. So uh, this mother was actually discharged well on the third post date, and she was sent home on Plexen at uh, that same dose, she was sent home also on antibiotics, and analgesics, and the plan was to reveal her six days later. However, uh, two days at home, uh, this lady developed uh, uh, chest pain, she developed difficulty in breathing and palpitations. So she reported back to us uh, in the hospital. Uh, on assessment, uh, we examined her and found that she wasn't pale. 
but she was in obvious distress that you could see. Her blood pressure at the time was 120 out of 80 millimeters of mercury and was saturating at uh, 96% at room air. However, her pulse, uh, she was tachycardic at 109 beats per minute and tachypneic at 30 breaths per minute. Her temperature was uh, 37.9 degrees Celsius axillary. However, the incision site, uh, we saw that she had some pockets of pus. Uh, the uterus was well contracted and vaginally uh, she had normal lochia. Uh, the other findings were actually normal. Chest findings were normal. Uh, uh, even the CVS systems were normal. So we made an impression of uh, pulmonary embolism. And obviously we had incision uh, wound sepsis from the class that I mentioned before. And of course, this was the time COVID was at its peak. So the impression of COVID, we, we were ruling out COVID at that time also. So that uh, when she presented, we picked a password for culture and sensitivity. And we also picked blood for culture and sensitivity. And the plan was to do chest uh, pulmonary angiogram to rule out pulmonary em embolism. And also of course to rule out COVID. And uh, we started at that time on the therapeutic dose of uh, Clexane, that is at 120 milligrams twice a day. And we started out on broad spectrum antibiotics. We removed the stitches at the incision site and did the dressing. And we also informed the surgeon that participated in the mesh repair. So uh, the following day, okay, later on subsequent reviews, uh, the chest pulmonary angiogram revealed that she had pulmonary thromboembolism, which were in the common basal arteries with their corresponding branches. And the past swab revealed that uh, one uh, gram stain revealed from positive rods, and the culture revealed the clepsial anemone and was ESBL positive. That means that it is resistant to all forms of penicillins and cephalosporins. And it was also resistant to all beta lactamase inhibitor combination. However, this uh, particular organism was sensitive to Cipro, or was sensitive to levofloxacin and amikacin. Uh, so uh, we pointed with antibiotic that uh, this particular organism is uh, responsive to, and continued with the flexin, and the daily dressing continued. Uh, so. On the seventh postoperative date, we decided to introduce uh, her to warfarin with a plan of withdrawing Clexen, which we did it on the ninth postoperative date. However, other management continued, that is uh, antibiotics and uh, daily dressing continued. So on the 17th postoperative date, the wound was ready for dressing. I mean, for closure, sorry. The wound was ready for closure. And we decided that we have to hold warfarin for at least two days. And the surgery, the secondary closure was done on the 20th postoperative date successfully. And two days later, she was discharged home uh, on warfarin still and to be reviewed in the clinic. Uh, our INR remained within the therapeutic range throughout up to the time of discharge. So uh, as you have heard, uh, this particular mother, the issues that we had from the beginning up to the time of the last discharge, uh, basically we had a mother who was morbidly obese from the BMI. Uh, we had a mother who had the goiter. We had a mother who had incisional hernia. This was from the previous scissor. And of course, as a complication, she developed pulmonary embolism. And she also developed a wound sepsis. And from the previous pregnancy she had before this particular one that brought her, uh, you realize that she also lost a, a pregnancy in the first trimester. Uh, so that is the mother that we had. We followed her up for three months after delivery. And currently she's actually doing very well. And we have started her on weight losing therapy. Thank you so much for listening. That is the mother that we had. If there are any questions, uh, the host can guide us on how to progress. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you very much, Dr. Rabu. Since we have a few minutes, we can entertain a few questions about the case presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rabu. Are there any questions? Dr. Castro, there were some two questions raised in the forum by Dr. Kalonji. Maybe we could look at them. Uh, the first one was if the hernia could have been delayed to be repaired. And then the second one, if it is common practice that all of these patients should be started in the same post uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Kalu uh, Dr. Kalonji. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, we, in fact, this patient need she, this patient needed three types of operations. They didn't mention this patient also had goita, and there was a, a discussion about operating. We wanted to reduce the number of times they are operated. So for goita, because she was euthyroid, we decided to postpone that operation, uh, and also because when you have you have goita and pregnancy is hyperactive. So therefore, we wanted to know its true state when you're not, when she's not pregnant. So the goiter operation was postponed, but because we are going to do the same kind of laparotomy, uh, we opted to to offer two operations in one under one kind of anesthesia to save the patient from another kind of operation. So that is why we did a scissor and repaired the and did a, and did a, a mesh hernia repair. So it was discussed with the surgical team and that was the best way forward to give them two operations under one anesthesia. Then yes, it's common practice for us to give patients plexin post operatively. So we assess the patients for VTE risk, which is venous thromboembolism. And for those patients who, for those patients who have high risk for venous thromboembolism, we send them home on on low molecular weight heparin or porphyrin. Because we know the VTE risk is, is biggest post-pregnancy. Thank you. There was a question about the current weight of the mother and BMI. Uh, we don't know yet, but the last we checked, she was 140 kilograms, 140 kilograms. Her BMI was 49, almost 50. Um, there was a question, there's a question from Doreen Mazak, Mazakpue. Uh, she breastfed her child all throughout and the anticoagulation she was on, the antibiotics she was on did not have, affect her breastfeeding. Her breastfeeding experience was okay and it was good. Uh, and therefore uh, it was not affected by any of her comorbidities. Uh, yes, there was a question from Namigade Christine about uh, the weight loss. So we referred her to a therapist that can be able to help her lose weight. Um, so it was to do with the diet plan and exercise plan. And we shall talk through more ex uh, losing weight therapies available in the next presentations. Um, yeah, I don't know if there are any more questions or we can move on to our next one. If you have questions, you can still ask them later. For well, now, um, let us move on. If there are no more quick questions, Dr. Richard. Uh, could there be use of, yes, no. Um, Dr. Ali, uh, Ali Baguma, could there be use of lipid lowering drugs in this patient? So we do not use statins in pregnancy and outside pregnancy, so they're contraindicated. And um, I don't know if that was the question uh, to do with uh, statins, but we don't use them. Um, and we don't often use medication to lose weight in pregnancy and outside pregnancy. So for now, they are contraindicated. It's only for those who are not about to get pregnant. Okay, thank you very much. So for now, um, we can switch over to our midwife to tell us more about the nursing care for an obese special. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John Tansi. I'm a researcher I'm sorry. Uh, I think there's an echo because there's someone near you. 
who is attending the same meeting, please ask them to mute themselves. So, Sister John Mary, kindly unmute yourself only. Yeah, we can start. Yeah, can we start, please? Yeah, can we start? Um, John Mary, we can't hear you. Kindly unmute yourself. Hello. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. We can hear you, but we can't hear Sister John Mary. I'm going to share with Dr. Rabu. Okay. Yeah. So that's fine. Could you could you start us off? Sorry, in the beginning. Okay. So you can take us to your first slide. I'll just quickly introduce you. Okay. Um, so Sister John Mary Nabatanzi is a registered midwife at Nsambia Hospital. She is the current in charge of the high dependence unit at, in at the maternity high dependence unit uh, that is really fully run by nurses and supported by the specialists. So you're welcome to start. Okay, thank you, good afternoon everyone. I'm going to take you through nursing care for a pregnant obese woman. But a few key things we are going to look at. We are looking at a pregnant we are looking at pregnancy, obese, and we are so particular looking at women. So obesity is an abnormal accumulation of fat. During pregnancy, women are likely to eat for too as they may have cravings. There is what we call gestational weight gain, but if it's more than expected, it becomes a complication, especially in women who are already obese. These are women when these women get pregnant, they are considered to be high-risk mothers. They are likely to get complications like high blood pressure, gestation diabetes, cardiac problems, and more difficult labor due to the size of the baby. They also get problems on auscultation for the fetal heart rate due to the fat layer on the mother's abdomen. Uh, the tools we use for measuring BMI we have a weighing scale for taking the weight of the mother, a for taking the height, 
mark tape for taking the uncircumference, tape measure for taking the waist circumference. We need a calculator and we need a medical form to record the findings. Nursing an obese mother. We nurse mothers using a nursing process, which is a systematic, patient-centered, goal-oriented, and individualized. This helps me assess a patient, diagnose, plan, implement, and evaluate. There are four nursing diagnoses for obese mothers. Um, actually, there are two types of diagnosis, but we, ha we have what we call the actual diagnosis and then the potential. So the actual nursing diagnosis, diagnosis are imbalanced nutrition more than body requirement. This mother is, she eats more than her body requires. Then disputed body image, uh, through history taking, she will tell you I was this slim person, this small person, but now I'm gaining weight, meaning her body image has been disturbed. Impaired social isolation, they at times feel they can no longer sit with people of a smaller, smaller size. Then deficient knowledge, through the assessment and interacting, uh, we try asking questions whether they know anything to do with obesity, but so many cases they're like, we don't know what to eat, that's why we end up having no knowledge about obesity. So what is our nursing plan? Nursing management. We encourage them to do early antenatal care and booking ins as soon as conception. For as long as she's realized that she's pregnant, it is very good to go to the hospital and we start off with antenatal care. It is also good to follow up the appointments as per discussed. Why? Remember, we are trying to, to, to look at her weight and we would want her weight to come down. So if she follows up the appointment, it is very good for us to follow up uh, weight loss challenges or management. Assess her previous nutrition status and eating preferences. It is always good to ask, how have you been eating? How many times do you eat a day? And if you're to eat, what do you eat? So as we can be of help to them. Assess for habits like smoking, alcohol, consumption presence of comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, and cardiac problems. Uh, the vital observations are very key to validate the subjective, mainly testing for urine, looking out for the urine protein, high blood pressure, in case to know whether we are dealing with a pregnancy-induced pressure or we are dealing with a mother who is eclampsy or preeclampsia. To, we also do the blood sugar levels, you know whether you're dealing with a mother who is diabetic or she's not diabetic. Um, assess a mother to look out for varicose vein, calf swelling, all pain. On coming in, she might not even know whether she has varicose veins, but when you to palpate her, examine her, you're able to feel there is a swelling in her leg or she's able to tell there is tenderness in my calf muscle. Uh, check the mother's height and monitor her weight per antenatal visit. What does it mean? Each time the mother comes for antenatal, it is mandatory for us to take their weight. Remember, at the back of our minds, we are worried of obesity. So it is always good to take their weight per visit to look out for any weight gain patterns. And when you take the weight, please, you record. Today, it is me attending to the patient, but tomorrow it may be another nurse. So if she has what to follow and see how best this mother being managed. Educate the mother on the foods necessary during pregnancy. They must be rich in iron, fiber, folic acid, calcium, phosphate, vitamins, and minerals. Why? Remember, she has a growing baby in her. This baby needs healthy foods for, for the baby to grow. So if a mother misses out on folic acid, chances are higher, she may have a baby with neural tube defects. If a mother misses out on pollution, chances are higher, baby, baby's bones will not be formed as expected. Uh, plan diet modification, considering her cultural, financial, and nutrition aspects, especially, especially the recommended calories intake for a pregnant woman should not exceed 
2,500 calories. What, the, what does this point mean? You don't just come and say, now your best, I'm planning for you. No, as you're assessing her, you're already aware of her culture, because she's explained a bit, your way of her financial, your way of her, what she can feed. So as you're planning, you plan according to what she's explained. Mother should be guided on food intake, portions, and frequency of meals. What does it mean? Uh, mothers should be allowed to eat. But instead of eating a full plate, allow her to eat small frequently. And at the end of the day, that small bit will be equivalent to the bigger plate she would have taken twice a day. Um, we manage mother's cravings and get them on what to eat. If a mother says, I'm craving for this, I want this, don't say you will not eat it. Please allow her to eat it, but guide her on which is good for her and the baby. Emphasize the importance of health dieting. What does it mean? If you want to have a health, health living, you want a health baby, please, there are some health emphasis we, we are supposed to follow. Um, smaller but frequent meals uh, may be better than large meals. Encourage fruit snack in the middle of the day. Uh, meaning not every time you feel you're hungry, you're supposed to eat food. You can take a snack and wait for the time for the supper or when food, food time. It gets the mother on which food they should avoid, especially with a pain. They may cause fetal anomalies, infertility, especially the secondary infertility. She will tell you, Ms. Hau, me, I'm already pregnant. Why do you have to say I might fail to get a baby? But infertility is, is um, divided into two. We have the primary and the secondary. So our main worry is more on the secondary. Today you're pregnant, but you might fail to get pregnant the next time. Encourage mother to have at least a 30 minutes walk per day. You know, it is, all, it is very good to walk at least for 30 minutes. It is not only good for the mother, but also for the baby. Baby stays active. The mother, mother sits in one place. The mother, mother sits in the car being driven everywhere. Baby also becomes normal. But we want using stairs instead of lifts. We encourage mothers to come up with activities that suit their health. What does it mean? She's pregnant, she's obese. She's not going to go for activities that are for slim people. It is always good to get exercise that fit her size and later she'll be stepped up for the slim ones. Flexibility on that selection coupled with family support and involvement may be also helpful. Remember we are telling this individual, this mother, but you know what? I want you to eat healthy, but she's going to get support from the family. So it is always good to involve in the family. And at the end of the day, she's getting church support from the family. Um, advice mother to deliver in the hospital setting that offers multidisciplinary collaborations in her care. This includes dietitians, midwives, anesthesiologists, obstetricians, surgeons, and auxiliary staff. Uh, care for the postnatal mothers. When, <clears throat> sorry, women that have had cesarean section, difficulty deliveries, and manual removal of placenta should ambulate as soon as possible to prevent clots and prepare sepsis. Uh, midwives on online, you've witnessed it. If a mother doesn't walk within the required time, we end up getting wound sepsis. Yet wound sepsis is one of our greatest fear. It takes long. It is income, income consuming. Yet we want to live within the limits. Administration of antibiotics on time. Yes, doctors come, do a review, and then they say give this drug. It is our role as a nurse to give them on time. Why? 
outside we shall see her as a normal person healing person but we don't know what is happening inside her body so it is always good to administer her antibiotics on time the other thing is about pain management no one wants pain so in case the mother is seizure she reports i'm in pain it is also very good as a midwife to take away that pain remember we are not looking on to having total pain but we, we rather want to have bearable pain for the mother uh, encourage her to develop weight weight management program that suits her health uh, postpartum assessment rule out any complications Vital observations, exhibition of blood pressure, fasting blood sugar, and urine protein. Collaborative management for better healing, which may include the dietitian. Remember, as a midwife, I might not have enough knowledge about diet. So it is always good to involve in someone, uh, to involve in someone who is good at pre preparation of food to come in and help a patient out or a mother out. Uh, contraceptives to prevent her from conceiving as soon because she needs time to shed off her baby weight. If you don't advise this mother about family planning, remember when you get pregnant, you get that weight. But if she's always pregnant, every year in and out, chances are higher that shedding of that baby weight might be so hard. So it is always good to put her on contraceptives to prevent her from conceiving as soon as possible. Our take home message today, care for an obese woman should be individualized. What does it mean? You don't going to bring every obese woman from everywhere and say today we are discussing, we are discussing about obesity. No, please meet one-on-one. -on -one. They'll be able to open up and see how best you can help them within their lines. Complications associated with obesity should be always look out for. Remember we said if you're obese, chances are higher, you might get complications like high blood pressure, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, diabetes. So what does it mean? If a patient comes to your unit, it is a key to take off the urine and see, do we have urine protein? What is the level of her sugars? Um, what is the state of the BP? Is it a high BP? Am I dealing with a pre uh, am I dealing with a preeclampsia or pregnancy induced? Uh, women should be counseled and encouraged to eat healthily. Walk 30 minutes, advised on the risk associated with obesity. Um, thank you very much. Stay blessed. Thank you very much, um, Sister John Mary Navatanzi. Um, a few controversial things there. So allow me to quickly do my presentation and then we can take questions thereafter. If that's okay with everybody. All right, because some of the questions and the things that have been brought up will be answered in this other presentation and then we can take the questions at the end of it all. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we are seeing it. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so um, obesity in pregnancy, as I've introduced myself already, um, that is my name, Castro Chisule, I'm a gynecologist at Nsambia. My disclosures, I've not been paid to give this talk. I'm a specialist at, in the Department of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology at Nsambia. I'm currently the head of maternal fetal medicine unit at Nsambia, and the private practice is at Alexandra Medical Center. So by definition, 
Body mass index, which we use to define obesity, is a measure of weight and height of an individual. The normal BMI is uh, 18 to 24.9. So how do we measure BMI? It's your weight divided by your height squared in meters. So that's a calculation. There are many free uh, apps that you can use to, um, there are ma ma many apps you can use to, um, to, to measure your, your, your BMI. Um, so the normal BMI is 18 to 24.9, being overweight is 25 to 29.9, and uh, obesity is a BMI of over 30 kilograms per meter squared. Obesity can be further classified into class one, class two, and class three. Class one being the milder part, a BMI of 30 to 34.9, class two is 35 to 39.9, and class three, is over 40 kilograms per meter squared. And this we call morbid obesity. So in pregnancy, we often use the booking BMI if a person books early or a pre-pregnancy BMI to define their risk in pregnancy. Um, what's the prevalence of obesity in Uganda? Uganda is not so bad. According to the WHO Diabetes Country Profile of 2016, obesity is currently at about four to 5%. Um, and in, it's uh, more prone, I mean, it's more in females, significantly more in females than in males in Uganda. And there was a study done by Stephen in Dugu et al. in 2018, and they found female obesity. Here they measured abdominal obesity. They found the female obesity to be at 19.5%, and the females were more likely to be abdominally obese compared to males, which were at 1.3. So if you compare 19.5 to 1.3, that's a big disparity. Our, our rate in Uganda of being overweight is at 18.6%, which is not so high, but something concerning. Um, a local study done by J. Balwa et al. in 2010 found that city dwelling, people stay in the city, people consume alcohol, people who smoke, people who don't engage in sports activity, uh, people who commute in taxi or private cars, or being female, just being female, was associated a lot with being obese. What does it look globally? Globally, we have 650 million people in the world that are obese. 1.9 billion are overweight, and we know currently the world is at 7.5 to 8 billion, so about a quarter of the world is overweight. The prevalence of obesity has tripled in the world from between 1975 and 2016. The most obese country is a small island called Nauru. This island is northeast of Australia with a, a national average of 61% obesity. The US is number 12 with 36% obesity. Egypt is the fattest country, uh, the fattest people in Africa. Uh, they rank 18th in the world and their obesity rate in, as a country is at 32%. Kenya um, is the most obese in our region. At, they come at 162nd with 7.1% obesity. Uganda is uh, 178th with 5% obesity rate. Vietnam is the lowest, the least obese country with 2.1%. We In the region, we can boast that we are the least obese. And in Uganda currently, we in one of those studies, the one of uh, Balwa, we found that you know different regions rank differently. Kampala was at 4.4%, whereas Kamuli was at 0%. So I don't know if it's something to do with Busoga or uh, just the national average. Um, yes. What is the pathobiology? So adipose tissue is a, can be an active endocrine organ. And when in excess, which is in obese patients, it can have a dysregulatory effect on metabolism, vascular, and particularly inflammatory pathways in many organs. And these things happen during pregnancy as well. They can affect our pregnancy outcomes. Now we should know that women who are, I mean, offspring, children who are born to obese mothers, because of, because of the fetal exposure to increased levels of glucose, insulin, lipids, and inflammatory cytokines, may get permanent or transient changes in their genetic metabolic programming. This will mean that uh, these children may have, uh, may later develop adverse health outcomes. Later in life, 
they will become fatter, they will have high blood pressure, they may get diabetes, only because they were born to an obese mother. This is how bad obesity can be. Um, so weight gain is a bit controversial, but the Americans, uh, the US Institute of Medicine guidelines recommended, a recommended weight gain, but let's put it that this is controversial and it's not globally accepted. Uh, it's not globally, let me say, there's no consensus uh, globally on what is the normal weight gain, but these guys gave us a uh, recommended weight gain that was related to least pregnancy adverse outcomes. So women who gained this weight were considered normal and had less adverse outcomes. And we had our own study here by, um, it was done at Insambia by Dr. Gava Brian, which showed uh, uh, weight gain and its uh, detrimental effects to that. Um, so normal weight gain for a person of normal BMI is 11.5 to 16 kilograms in pregnancy. Those who are overweight, 25 to 29.9, should gain less, which means seven kilograms to 11.5 kilograms. And those who are obese should actually gain much less, but this doesn't happen, okay? This is a recommended weight gain, but you'll find the, 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 uh, it, it happens the other way around. So these weight gain uh, re, uh, ranges were the ones that, were show, that showed better maternal and fetal outcomes. And this was uh, Siaga, Riz et al. in 2009. Okay, uh, so what risks are associated with obesity? There are the plethora of, uh, of risks associated with obesity. And these are some of which we got. Spontaneous miscarriage with an odds ratio of 1.2. That would mean that there are 20, they have a 20% increased chance of getting a spontaneous miscarriage. They have increased chances of getting recurrent miscarriage, congenital anomalies, risks of stillbirth, cardiac dysfunction, proteinuria, sleep apnea, gestational diabetes, hypertension, preeclampsia, iatrogenic preterm births, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, congenital anomalies, and these were mostly neurotube defects with uh, high chances of getting spina bifida and hydrocephalus. I've already mentioned that fetuses, uh, a fetus born to an obese woman is likely to be macrosomic, big. Infants born to obese women are likely to have increased fat. Children born to obese women are likely to develop metabolic syndrome, obesity, asthma, and altered behavior. In fact, one obese parent uh, gives a baby two to three chances two to three times fold for getting childhood obesity and cardiometabolic morbidity. But if there are two parents who are obese, the chance of, of getting hypertension, diabetes, and cardiac disease by that child increase 15 fold. So what do we do for mothers who are, or women who are obese and want to conceive? So we ask them that, you know, please, before you conceive, try as much as possible to lose weight, to get your BMI below 30, okay? Because we know that even with, with high BMIs, they may be able to get, you know, they get anovulatory bleeding, they're the ones associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome, and therefore infertility can come in. And just loss of five to 7% can reduce the risk of, uh, of having anovulation and therefore increase their fertility. It can reduce the risk of stillbirths, hypertensive disorders, and fetal microsomia. Weight loss increases the chances of a successful vaginal birth after cesarean section. And if a BMI is over 30, we advise women to take five milligrams of folic acid uh, at least one month as they're trying to conceive, and they should take it throughout the first trimester if they're to conceive. Um, there have been considerations for vitamin D supplementation. Um, evidence is still inconclusive, but we suggest that you can still give vitamin D for these women. Um, weight loss, as we've already mentioned, weight loss is very important preconception wise. Five to seven percent loss improves ovulation and pregnancy outcomes. So, what ways can people lose weight? They can have a diet modification, which means we reduce their calorie food we reduce the high calorie foods. And you know, in our setting, this is the food we consider food, yemere, rice, posho, matoke, cassava. And sometimes when we feel that we haven't eaten this kind of food, tetuli demere. So we have to reduce this kind of food because it's very detrimental to our weight. Um, 
we encourage an exercise routine at least 150 minutes per week of aerobic exercises. These are divided sessions. And this can also, by on its, on its own, improve anovulatory infertility. Medications are not recommended, but there are drugs that are used uh, prior to conceiving. They're not recommended for a person who's trying to conceive or in pregnancy, but they're there. We have bariatric surgery, and this can be used by morbidly mor 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 obese patients. Um, after failing diet and, and uh, exercise, uh, such operations include laparoscopic gastric banding and sleeve gastrectomy. Um, and usually after patients have had this kind of surgery, we ask them to avoid pregnancy for six to 12 months. And this is because we need to optimize their weight loss. And because after these operations, they get nutritional de de deficiencies, we ask them to, to delay until we correct these nutritional deficiencies, which include you know, iron, folate, calcium and the other things. So for every pregnancy unit, and if we have any, um, any policy makers in the room, uh, hospitals and different facilities must be equipped to handle obese mothers. Okay, so we have to have increased circulatory space, accessibility, increase like of doorways and door widths, corridors. Uh, we need to have safe working loads of equipment. So our theater operating tables should be able to accommodate obese women. Our weighing scales should be able to run up to at least 200 kilo, kilo, kilograms. The floors should also be suited for women who are obese. Um, availability of appropriate equipment like large BP size, uh, like large BP cuff sizes, compression stockings that are appropriate for people who are obese, large chairs without arms that will be restrictive large wheelchairs, large ultrasound couches, delivery beds, and, the and theater trolleys. All these things are important for us to be able to manage this kind of people. Um, theater gowns should, should, should be big. And we also need long surgical instruments because sometimes when we operate deep in the pelvis, we need appropriate uh, instruments to use. Antinatally, um, weight and height should be measured, and this is done very well by the nurses, and they usually put, us, uh, put them in the antenatal card. And as I've mentioned, there's currently lack of consensus globally, but we have an indication of how much a person should gain weight during uh, pregnancy. Information should be given to women, not only those who are pregnant, but also those who are pregnant about the risks that they should expect about uh, the effects of obesity in pregnancy. It's important that we disseminate information and know that it's not nice to be, held, to, to be obese when pregnant. Anti-obesity drugs are not recommended in pregnancy. Uh, women that have a high BMI of morbid obesity, 40 to, I mean, over 40 should be referred to the anesthesiology antenatally for assessment, usually IV access, regional and general anesthesia, plans can be made with time. Antinatally, we need to screen for GDM, and we usually recommend OGTT at 16 weeks, earlier than normal, or we can do, uh, we can do 24 to 28 weeks um, um, screening. BP should, be measured at every, a BP should be measured at every visit um, to look out for preeclampsia. Um, in addition, um, if there are women who have other risk factors, for example, if she's prime gravida, age of over 40, family history of PET, multiple pregnancy, IVF, we recommend now 150 milligrams of aspirin from 12 weeks. Um, they should be risk assessed for venous thromboembolism, uh, which is clot formation. We must also screen for mental health disease because they are at an increased risk for mental health disease. Uh, as we saw that congenital anomalies and chromosomal abnormalities are also a risk factor, we should offer screening for these, which include NT scans, which are ultrasounds, fetal anatomy scans, and if available, we can also use uh, non-invasive prenatal screening. SFH measurements may be inaccurate, so we need to consider ultrasound for fetal size uh, estimation. Um, the other thing is we need to screen for obst obstructive sleep apnea. This is one of the things we people forget to look out for. So people who are, who are obese tend to have excessive loud snoring, daytime sleepiness. They're always sleepy during the day and they wake up at night abruptly, you know, gasping and choking. So if they have observed apnea, they need to be helped because they are at risk of hypoxia when they, get, when they go for anesthesia. 
So an already obstructive sleep apnea only on its own increases the risk of PET, cardiomyopathy, and pulmonary embolism. Intrapartum, we use usually normal fetal monitoring like, like any other with a peanut, and sometimes it's difficult to hear the heart. Um, these women are at increased risk of stillbirth, and therefore it's some societies consider uh, induction of labor at 40 weeks. Uh, which also reduces the risk of cesarean section without increasing adverse outcomes. Um, usually, uh, fatter women have longer labor, longer first stage, but there's no effect on second stage. Um, if a CTG can be used abdominally, we can use it, but if it cannot pick a fetal heart, then we use a fetal scalp electrode. Um, and then we also notice that higher BMI, or the studies show that higher BMI re reduces the chances of a successful VBAC. And this is just uh, from a study of Gabor Johas in 2005, showing a BMI of less, of less than 19 and the VBAC success rates. Okay, so pre pregnancy v, uh, BMI versus VBAC success rate. And when we not notice down that as you go lower, which means higher uh, BMI, the risk, the chance of a successful VBAC, which is a vaginal birth after Caesar, reduces. And this was uh, statistically significant. Perioperatively, anesthesia consult should be done antenatally. Um, and this would help to review comor comorbidities, venous access, airway difficulties, risk of, hyper, of, of, uh, of hypoxia and hypercapnia. Um, Epidural and spinal anesthesia is generally preferred. However, it can be more technically difficult, higher failure rate, hypotension, and can affect respiratory function for up to two hours after the procedure. GA is not contraindicated. However, uh, there is anticipated difficulty in intubation and pre-oxygenation. So we should have required skill around. Um, we often give broad spectrum antibiotics for all cesarean sections and even post delivery. Okay, and for well, I mean, women who are obese, they usually need higher doses. For example, th uh, three grams of kefazolin for a 120 kilogram patient. Um, we prefer lower transverse skin incision, preferred to the midline because you get less wound complications. Uh, closure of the subcut of a subcut layer of fat, if it's lower than, if it's higher than 2.5, we generally recommend. Subcutaneous drains remain controversial. Skin, uh, this is also controversial, but a few, a, few, a few societies prefer interrupted non-absorbable sutures to prevent uh, wound infection tracking. Because if you use a subcutaneous continuous and infection starts from one side of the wound, it, the chance of it tracking to the whole wound is higher than if you have interrupted sutures. If you have interrupted sutures and there's a localized infection on the wound, that part can be re released and treated without opening up the whole wound. So that's one of the theories around that. Postpartum, we, we want to have an early mobilization and hydration of the, of the patient. So they walk early. Uh, we don't let women lie 24 hours in bed after spinal. So usually they can get, get up after eight to eight hours. I mean, six to eight hours, they can, get, they can already sit up. Uh, they can have something to drink. Uh, we offer low molecular weight heparin given to routinely for all obese patients for prophylaxis. And this will depend also on other risk factors for us to continue. In this current, in the patient we had, we actually sent her home on, uh, on Clexen, 60 milligrams, but she still got a, a PE after. So we encourage people to assess women and those who are obese might require um, continued anticoagulation even postpartum and into the piperium. Uh, we encourage DVT stockings to prevent, um, uh, to, to, to prevent DVT. Uh, prevention of surgical site sepsis, so good, uh, good uh, operative technique, antibiotics, aseptic technique, and use of clippers for hair removal. Clippers are those things that we use like to cut our hair from in the saloon instead of using a shaver. They are associated with less infection. Breastfeeding uh, is good as it promotes also weight reduction while promoting bonding. Contraceptive advice is necessary to promote a longer interpregnancy interval and initiate loss, weight loss programs. Um, so we, this is from the Green Top Guideline, number 37, published in 2016. Um, and it shows the, the um, amount of 
low molecular heparin and unfractionated heparin dosages we must give for the weights of the patient. So you realize that uh, if a patient is, you know, 95 kilograms, we give a 60 milligram uh, Clexen dose, not the usual 40. So 40 is up to 90 kilograms, and the higher they go, the more um, the more low molecular weight heparin they need. So our patient was 140, and we gave her 60 milligrams. One of the thoughts was we might have underdosed her. She she might have required more, which was in the range of 80 milligrams for prophylaxis. Yeah, so that is all for, and we use, I used many resources, but uh, nice guideline, that one, and up to date, the article on obesity in pregnancy provided the biggest chunk of the information. Thank you very much for listening. So at this point in time, we can encourage any questions. So do we have any questions? for the team that has presented. I can see some questions on, uh, on the chat. Okay. Yes, there was a question by Dr. Nachin to Eleanor. Uh, yes, women who are obese are at risk of uh, mental illness, as we've seen. That patient, we did actually saw a clinical psychologist um, along her time because she had three weeks, three or four weeks in hospital, and it got to her, and therefore we supported her me mentally, and we screened her for postnatal depression. She didn't have, but I mean, she was supported throughout. Uh, we don't have a protocol yet for postpartum depression. But we usually use uh, we use uh, risk based criteria to uh, to look out for that. So maybe Rabu can look through the other questions and see. Um, Dr. Castro, there's a question. Is BMI good enough for diagnosing obesity in pregnancy? Yes, uh, BMI is good enough for diagnosing. Mostly the only thing we can do. There have been different ways of, uh, use, of, of assessing obesity. One of the ways is to use MWAC, which is the mid upper arm circumference. The other part is to use abdominal circumference using the waist tapes, um, all of which correlate well with the weight and height measurements so bmi is the best we've got for is the best we have for um is the best we have for bmi for obesity okay there's another question of um the point of recommended calories how do we make the 2500 calorie intake practical how is she able to take the calorie intake from her regular meals to tell the 2,500 calorie limit. Okay, uh, thank you for that. It's a very good question, but it's very technical. So what we do, we refer them to the dietitian uh, and the dietitian will be able to sit with them and look at the food they have locally available with them. Uh, and from that, they would work out a meal plan on how to get those calories in and how to reduce on the on the unnecessary foods that are, are not good for our pregnancy. So it goes through, uh, it is a consultation with a dietitian that they come up with this, uh, with the food plan. Maybe a follow up, how would you advise facilities uh, that have no access to a dietitian to go around that? Uh, um, hmm, that's a bit difficult. Anyone um, on the call? Maybe you can chip in. 
so. Yeah, we welcome anyone maybe to give us advice. If those people don't have a, a dietitian, how would they be able to work out meal plans? Which is, of course, the usual case for most of you guys. Jackson Tabule, your hand is up. Yes, go right ahead, Karin. Jackson, we can't hear you. Jackson, please draw near to your microphone. Yeah, thank you very much. Are you hearing me well now? Yes, better. My name is Dr. Table Jackson. I am an obstetrician and gynecologist at Mulago Specialized Women and Natal Hospital. The issue of diet is, uh, is, has always been challenging. The most important thing is to speak to these mothers and let them appreciate the challenge that they have, the challenge of obesity and making them appreciate the importance of losing weight. Many times people will tell you, but for me, I don't eat food. Even if I just take breakfast, I just continue gaining weight. I only eat little food at supper at, at lunchtime. But you see everything that we put in our mouth to swallow inside, other than drugs is food. These people, need to appreciate that food is equal to weight. Now, if they appreciate that they need to lose weight to be okay, then they need to know that probably what they are eating is more than what their bodies require for normal function. That is why the body is storing the food. The body actually behaves like a the, the head we have in our homes. When you have too much food, you look for somewhere to keep it. So when they're eating more than what the body requires, the body stores it. So they need to appreciate that what they're eating is more than what the body requires for daily survival. So this makes them to start working hard on their own to reduce on how much they eat, to exercise, and to cooperate with their doctors and other health workers on weight loss programs. Now, I have spoken to many dietitians and I've learned something very important from them. It's called a food pyramid. If you drew a pyramid and you drew, draw another line about three, about three quarters up, and then you draw, you divide that pyramid into four. That brings you four pyramids. I have, I have no way of drawing it right now. Yeah, so if you draw, you can even just draw a, a, a square box and divide that into four boxes. One of the boxes is, makes it a quarter. The rest of the two thirds is another portion. So one portion, which is the quarter, it includes animal products, oils, and sugars. The rest of the three quarters is plant products. So whenever she's eating her food, she has to ask four questions. One question is, what are you eating? The second question is, how much are you eating? The third question is, when do you eat your food? The fourth question is, what do you do with your food you eat? This would take a whole lesson of four, about, about an hour. So. Most importantly, they should appreciate that they need to lose weight. And for them to lose weight, they need to know that they are part of the solution. There is need for mental setup change. And then I, do not, it with their I don't think we have enough to the to adjust their behavior. Thank you. Hello? Thank you. Thank you very much. Castro, you are, Dr. Castro, you are showing something well. 
Hassan, could you flash it again? Yes, I don't know if it can be seen. Yes. Can be seen? Okay, so usually when you draw a circle and divide it in four, the food in one the food is in one one quadrant. Cassava, rice, matoke, osho, you know. And then we have this quarter is vegetables. This part down here is fruit. Then the other part here is soup, what we call soup. Meat, PZ, beans. Yeah? Most times we have the whole plate full of food and then soup is, on, is poured on top. But if we use these quarters, you know, these quarters can help us understand um, what, can, what we consider healthy. And for pregnant women, usually we ask them to have uh, small but frequent meals. Eh? Smaller but frequent meals, which would mean, you know, you have something breakfast at eight, then you have a snack at 11, which can be an apple, then something at lunch. To have um, 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 here because we want to avoid postprandial hyperglycemia as well. That is dangerous. I hope that is a bit clear. Thank yeah. you very much. Questions, Tulabe? Uh, there was a question from Dr. Irumba. What is the role of calcium, magnesium, selenium in ANC for obese women? Yeah, it is just to optimize the micronutrients that help in uh, formation of the baby. Okay, there's another question. Besides lifestyle modification, could there be any interventions towards minimizing prevalence of microsomia in obese women? Microsomia. So large for gestational age. So what we usually, it's only, you, it's only via diet. It's only via diet. Diet and lifestyle modification. That's the only way we can prevent. Those are the things we can control. Okay, because when when you eat a lot, um, they, they, we we always give these examples in the antenatal clinic that if the the woman eats a lot, there's a lot, lot of sugar in the system. The baby just you know has a mouth that is open. They are just eating everything, and the baby has no breaks. So the more sugar you give the baby, the more sugar the baby consumes, and the fatter baby will become. If you give less sugar, baby gets less sugar, and therefore does not put on as much weight because the baby is bound to put on weight because of uh, all the sugar they're getting from your diet. I hope right, I thank you. I hope yes. so. There's another hand, Dr. Emoru Arthur. You can unmute and go right ahead and ask your question. Thank you for the presentation. Really lovely presentation. Uh, I just had a, a small contribution uh, on the anesthetic part and uh, follow up with the question. For the anesthesia, for the mobile obese people, usually we there should be longer than usual spinal needles or epidural needles. The usual spinal needles have a length that can allow you in about 90 millimeters, but the much longer ones can extend even up to 120 millimeters, which uh, enables you to access the other thing that we sometimes do is use uh, neuraxial ultrasounds and it increases uh, your success a lot uh, in finding the space. Uh, and actually for these people, we usually prefer to do uh, regional anesthesia, the spinal epidural, than putting them to sleep because that is, it's already difficult in a normal pregnant woman. Uh, and now if a person is obese, it makes it much more complicated. And then, uh, Maybe for the team, how were you handling with the retraction and making sure that you have space to work? Because I've seen what I've seen some I've seen some surgeons do in some place. So when they clamp maybe on a, a tissue and they need retraction, they they will tie some form of thread and anchor it to a certain part of the bed and keep it uh, retracted. Uh, okay, I know the explanation may not bring it out clearly, but uh, it's uh, possible. I don't know how you guys pulled off the making sure that you have the space uh, to do what you need to do. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Asa. Uh, anesthesiologist, uh, our friends in theater. So this, uh, in fact, if we knew we were going to do this, we could have taken a picture. We could have taken a picture of what we did because it was not easy as you, suspe as, as you suspected. Huh? So what we did, we got um, this mask uh, tape, um, the strapping, what you call strapping. We got strapping, uh, we made a thick, two long thick strappings, and then we placed them on the abdomen below the umbilicus. So think about the umbilicus, go below and put two tape, two, um, two strappings, and we pulled the abdomen upwards. So we got strapping, placed it on the, on the, on the, on the abdomen, and then we pulled it upwards. And then after we, we swabbed, we, 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 we draped. So in that way, we kept the abdominal penis, which was usually in your way. It's in your way like that. So we had to pull the abdomen up and then operate in the lower transverse region. It was a bit of a challenge, but if you retract, it really helps well. So even when you open the, the, the abdomen, you get, um, uh, what do you call it? You can call it a little wood or uh, what can, or a lens, you get into the fat and you pull upwards. It's a lot of work for the purpose of retracting. We actually had a student on table for, for, the, for that purpose of retracting. It was a bit of a challenge, but it helped, we, it helped that we retracted the skin before and we also retracted the fat as soon as we, we entered. So we had space. Thank you. Great. Actually, someone had suggested use of human retractors, so probably the student came in handy there. Um, Peter Gimei is also adding to the anesthesia bit and says labor analgesia is vital, <clears throat> and secondary death I may use during cesarean section will come in handy. Yes. We agree completely. Uh, women who are obese, uh, if you give labor analgesia, it will help our experience in labor and therefore um, progress better. And uh, women, and then also because of bleeding that's everywhere, um, if you use and if you use dathomy, it will help out because you know pregnant women can have many bleeders and they can be well vascularized fat. So dathomy comes in very handy. I agree completely. All right, um, I'm trying to, members, you can raise your hands if you have a question. Uh, Dr. Irumba is asking, how do we handle hypoglycemia of babies born to obese mothers? Should all of them be taken to NICU? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, does Dr. Rabu want to answer? Uh, yes. Uh... Actually, not all these babies are taken to NICU. We usually, we have NICU and we have baby unit. Uh, NICU handle more advanced cases and baby unit handle those that are moderate, like basically babies that you want to feed and uh, you want to observe them. So uh, these mothers who are based, we know that most of their babies are macrosomic and those macrosomic babies are at high risk of uh, hypoglycemia. So we usually take them to, to the nursery so that we can feed them as early as possible because you realize that most times these mothers, just after delivery, most of them actually don't have the breast milk. So we take them to the nursery so that we can feed them as soon as early as possible to prevent that uh, risk of hypoglycemia. So all of them actually, those mothers who are uh, morbidly obese and those who have uh, GDM, diabetic, we tend to take them to the nursery for, for that purpose but not to the NICU. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Rabu. As a principal at Insambia Hospital, all macrosomic babies who are 4.0 kilograms and above are taken to the nursery. And at that time, they, are, they have their blood glucose is monitored. And those that have hypoglycemia are given dextrose IV uh, as they wait for either donated breast milk or mother's breast milk. And I saw one of the pediatri pediatricians on, on, on the call. She could probably help us, Dr. Sanyu Nalunga. She can also enlighten us more about what they do. Okay.
Okay, as uh, Dr. Sanyu comes to respond as well, um, Castro, I've seen some questions around mental health obesity and relation with obesity. There is a, <clears throat> a comment, consider that pregnant women crave for foods that they cannot be denied. Therefore, we need a psychologist for them to enhance their decision-making. That is from Namisi Charles. Any comments around that? Um, yeah, so we, we, in my presentation, I think I mentioned that these women are at risk of mental health disease. And therefore we usually try to support them through. Um, the science behind which I'm not sure. However, we know that uh, from the nurses, from Sister John Mary's presentation, they have an altered image, usually low mood, and therefore they have um, low self-esteem. And this can be risk factors for um, kind of depression. So that's one way we can look at it. Um, yes, I didn't understand the other question by Charles Namisi. Oh, he was also was advocating that. for a psychologist to be part of the team to enhance decision making. Yes, I agree. We need to do that more. It's just that the psychologists are not as 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 available as they are in you know in Kampala, but it's a very good idea to have a psychologist on board. I think Dr. Nalunga is available now. Yes, I see a hand. Dr. San, you go right ahead. Dr. Nalunga, yes, you can um, unmute. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think Dr. Castro, you had raised a question about what we do for babies that are born above four kilos. We do admit them to the nursery, and the purpose, the main purpose of admitting them is to monitor their blood glucose levels and to initiate feeding as early as possible. If the mother is delivered by C-section, usually that's a bit of a challenge of initiating breastfeeding. So we, we opt for other options, but if the mother delivered by SVD, we initiate breastfeeding and three hourly monitor the blood glucose levels for about 24 hours. We only admit those who have persistent hypoglycemia to the NICU but it's a protocol. All babies above four kilos are admitted to the nursery for that purpose. Thank you, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Okay, I want to read two more and then we can wrap this up. Um, maybe for Sister John Mary, uh, Sister is, uh, Harriet Kimbaba says, thank you, Sister. I was glad to hear about the nursing process coming up. However, I would like to know from you whether it, this is done practical and documented, or is it for the purpose of presentation, making nursing processes to remain theoretical rather than practical? If fully used in Zambia, thank you and keep it up. Thank you very much, Harish. And uh, Zambia being a, a training institute, we use the cadets. And now me being in HDU, I manage my patients using a cardiac. I manage my patient using the nurse's process. Why? I would love to know how this patient was admitted, what we have presenting complaint, and how did we manage? Did we help her out or we failed out? So we use them at the Zambia Hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Any last uh, comments, colleagues uh, who are attending question? There was a question on the best, um, the best uh, family planning method. Yes, um, hormonal contraceptives generally tend to cause weight gain, some of them, especially the injectable, the three months one. Um, and therefore may not be ideal for an obese woman. What we prefer is uh, an IUD is good, uh, a, non, a copper IUD, IUCD is very good for, for them. Um, a hormonal IUD is also okay. Um, women who are on, uh, usually we don't encourage COCs. COCs, POPs, especially COCs for an, an obese woman, because it's MEK category three, they have an increased risk of 
clot formation if they are on oral contraceptives. Um, that risk is less if they are on POPs only, which are progesterone only pills. However, um, we discourage most of the hormones, especially estrogen containing uh, family planning because of the risk of clot formation. So IUD would be the best for an obese woman. Okay, we'll take one last one, Jackson. My comment is about uh, the use of anticoagulants for these obese patients. Uh, you realize some of them are, uh, have already been on anticoagulants during pregnancy. So some of them have been on aspirin, some of them on clexane. So aspirin usually should be stopped at least a week before surgery. Clexane can be stopped about three days before surgery. And uh, restarting of Clexane should be at least 18 to 24 hours after surgery, not immediately. Those are the questions I have, thank you. Okay, uh, Victoria, it's a quick one as we wind up. Victoria, Victoria Elizabeth, your hand is up. Okay. Um, there was a question. Doctor, anticoagulation, yes. how long from Mwanguzi Kenneth? Um, duration is usually up to 10 days. However, if the mother has other risk factors, anticoagulation should be given for the whole six weeks duration. Okay. Victoria, are you ready to ask or make a comment? Yes, thank you very much, presenters, and thank you for organizing such a wonderful um, <laughs> meeting. And um, my concern was about um, the management of these babies when they are born. I'm a midwife from the Na National Midwives Association. Yes, it is very true when these babies are born, some don't need a NICU, but really the ideal is that these babies must go through NICU for the reason of monitoring the sugar levels and also initiating this baby on breastfeeding. Yes, they are born with a big weight. However, sometimes they are born when they are very weak. So they literally need the NICU to monitor and that is what we've been doing as midwives. And again on the psychological part, because I heard you wanted to find a psychologist, these mothers cause during antenatal with good management, we ensure that we take them through the antenatal by giving them the antenatal health education and preparing them psychologically. So by the time she gives birth, at least she'll be prepared for the consequences. But we continue, it is a continuous process even during the postnatal period. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Castro, I think we'll stop right here. I'll ask you to make a few concluding remarks and I'll wrap it up. Okay, uh, thank you very much for listening to us. Um, we know that each one of you in your different uh, spheres of practice engage with obese women uh, and obese individuals. We hope that our presentation could just have been a stimulant for us to read a little bit more and to improve our practice in pregnancies associated with obese women. So thank you very much for listening to us. A big round of applause to the midwife, Sister John Mary, for making a good presentation. And uh, SHO3, who is almost a specialist, Dr. Walter, both from Zambia Hospital. We thank you very much for presenting. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kisule Castro and the team from Zambia for honoring this invitation to share with us on obesity in pregnancy and postpartum period. We've had quite a number of comments appreciating and applauding the presentations, the details, 
and uh, having to explain the nursing part and the medical part as well as the case presentation. So we really appreciate you. Thank you for all that have tuned in uh, today. I'd like to make just a few announcements before you drop off. Um, the National Safe Motherhood and Expert Committee continues to host these webinars for learning purposes every month going forward. It's uh, intended for frontline health workers all over the country. So I'd like to call upon our facility and district leadership who are online to see how you can get more of our frontline health workers to participate in these webinars, uh, to listen in, uh, ask questions, but also to share. We are making sure that each month we have a different region, Stroke University or Regional Referral Hospital, arranging for these, uh, to facilitate these webinars. So we'll be coming to you. So on that note, I would like to announce the next webinar, which will be, which will be on the 29th of April, most likely. And uh, we'll be looking at immunization in pregnancy. We hope that in that webinar, we can highlight the immunization, the immunizations that are needed in an expectant mother, highlighting the schedules, the discussion around hepatitis in pregnancy and the, the role of the vaccine, HPV and uh, countering negative undertones. We hope to highlight a bit of discussion around TB and um, uh, uh, a bit of the EPI immunization schedules for children, especially around the time of uh, birth. And that will be handled by the team from Makere University, including uh, the National Referral Hospitals uh, that uh, serve Makere University Med College of Health Sciences. Mm -hmm. So look out for the emails. We send an email uh, to all of us that have registered. And also we shall share the slides and uh, PowerPoint presentations and the recording. Look out for an email from Safe Motherhood, National Safe Motherhood. Our email is nasmec, ug at gmail.com. So you can also write back to us and uh, participate in uh, building these webinars. I would also like to bring your attention to the PPH, Postpartum Hemorrhage Activity Framework that has been designed to accelerate reduction in uh, mothers dying due to postpartum hemorrhage. And we shall be coming to most of the regions wherever you are to see how we can support the facilities to quickly uh, accelerate reductions in PPH. There'll be a number of activities, so look out for that as well. Um, I also want to say that very soon we'll be getting accreditation for this CIP, uh, webinar so that we can have CPD points allocated for the um, medical cadres, the nursing cadres, and the allied health professionals. So today I was happy to see my disciplinary team coming in and a physiologist who are here with us, the mental people, the nurses, midwives. So we are working around the clock to get that accreditation as soon as possible. Um, other than that, I want to thank you so much for attending this webinar. Uh, when the emails come, please register well in advance and uh, you always get a, an email that confirms your registration, which also has a link to join this webinar. And please circulate the information as much as possible to all our colleagues, wherever they are in the, across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. We'll meet again next month for immunization pregnancy. Uh, this is hosted by the National Safe Motherhood Expert Committee at the Ministry of Health.